It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. As we make our way into the year 2015, Americans can in many respects take great pride in the racial progress made over the past 50 years. The ending of a dark history of segregation and outright subjugation of African Americans, the election, regardless of anyone's politics, of our first black president, a full generation of Americans have reached middle age since passage of the Civil and Voting Rights Acts that ended legally mandated segregation. And over the past 50 years, millions of African Americans have had tremendous economic and educational success. Yet we have all been reminded over the past many months that despite that great progress, our country still has fundamental problems. The protests and debates in reaction to the deaths of black men at the hands of white police officers in Ferguson, Missouri and other cities have been jarring. And for many of us, the reactions on all sides have sounded dated and rarely constructive. It has felt at times that America no longer quite knows what to debate around race anymore, and even less how to resolve these bitter conflicts. So in this American Forum, we begin a very important new series entitled, What Now? Starting with our two very distinguished guests today, Julian Bond, one of the seminally important African-American leaders of the past half century, and historian Phyllis Leffler. We will be bringing to you in the weeks ahead dialogues with other thinkers, scholars, and other leaders with some fresh and perhaps less predictable answers to the question, what now? Where do we go from here? What should Americans, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Tea Party, any category, what should all of us who want full and unfettered opportunity for all be talking about now? What now? We are privileged to begin this special series with the architects of a fascinating new project focused on key African-American leaders. Over more than a decade, University of Virginia historian Phyllis Leffler and former NAACP National Chairman Julian Bond interviewed dozens of black leaders about their experiences, their personal backgrounds, and the how and why they emerged as essential leaders in the midst of such historic change. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to have you. So you've done this amazing thing, this whole range of interviews with a, a, a variety of African-American leaders. Uh, some were huge in the civil rights era, the glory years of the civil rights movement, some who have been important in other ways since then or who were not as significant during the civil rights period. But Julian, you're not a classic scholar, academic historian kind of figure as, as Phyllis is, but you've been an important black leader, quote unquote, since almost since you became an adult. The vast majority of your life, you've sort of been in this category of an important black leader. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the, in the 60s at the height of the movement. You were among the first black members of the Georgia legislature since Reconstruction when you were elected to that and then legislature refused to seat you. In a case you took to the Supreme Court to, to finally get your seat in the legislature, you ran for Congress in the 1980s against another very... Uh, he, he ran against me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, sometimes there are disagreements among mm -hmm. important uh, leaders, mm -hmm. aren't there? Uh, and then chairman of the NAACP and a whole variety of other things, including uh, your work as a teacher and scholar uh, with thousands of students, really. But so when the idea for this project first came along more than 10 years ago, what was your motivation to do this or become involved with it? Well, it was Phyllis's idea. She's the engine behind all of this. But it was interesting to me, what was it that made leaders leaders? How did they become leaders? Could you get a group of them and ask them questions about their formative years, who was important to them, their mothers, their fathers, their school teachers, those kind of, what was it that made them? And uh, I was just attracted to it and wanted to be a part of it. And so fellas, for you, why did you want to do this? What, were the, what, what took you to this in the very beginning? We started the project in 2000 when almost all the literature that existed on leadership was not 
did not include black voices in it. I would dare say most of that literature still doesn't. And uh, so I just saw it as an opportunity for, uh, for, for developing materials uh, that would create for us a rich archive of ideas and thoughts that had not yet been done. And Julian was a very happy and willing partner, so we developed this co-directorship of our project. Did you imagine it taking a dozen years, or 14 years? Sure. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure how long it would take. But it, it's been a lot of fun. It was complicated to get people. The person we wanted that we couldn't get or was President Obama. He would be an important addition to this. But you know, we, I think we, at, we started asking him late in his political life, and uh, we couldn't get him. Was he even on your radar screen before, you know, before 2004? Like when you were first talking about this, that anybody even aware that there was this guy in Illinois named Barack Obama? Well, I, I knew about him because I had friends in Chicago who said, we have this young state senator, he's going to be somebody. And we said, oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but uh, I think we went after him late, after he'd been elected at least once. Um, and we just uh, were too late. I and think. we think he was a little busy, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> so there's a lot of discussion about what is leadership. In the course of putting this together, is there a difference it, from what you've learned between leadership and black leadership? I have two different answers to that question. First of all, I think these leaders speak to all people and they have important lessons and uh, stories to share about their own personal trajectories to leadership, which I think apply to anybody. So in that sense, I don't think there is black leadership as opposed to any other kind of leadership. That being said, uh, it's clear to me that to become a leader in America, African Americans needed to deal with the issue of race. They needed to think of themselves in the larger paradigm, the larger context of America. And one of the things that I found by looking at looking back at the interviews in order to write the book is that um, is that black leaders are always negotiating these larger intractable issues of race, and as a result, I find that they're more concerned with strategies and agendas than they are specifically with traits and attributes of leaders. So a lot of the leadership literature just says, oh, you have to be visionary, you have to be um, energetic, you have to project A, B, and C. Have a clear mission and, uh, and strategy and the, to pursue. And that, those were not the kinds of answers that we got as we asked people about leadership and what it took to be a leadership. Well, and I assume that another part of that that would be uh, specific to black leadership, quote unquote, is just, particularly in a somewhat earlier time, that it's also leadership under duress, that you're talking about uh, leaders who are engaged in missions that, uh, particularly in the beginning, are up against extraordinary odds. It's not just a business leader who's trying to come up with a product and be a good leader in organizing a company around a good idea. The, these, many of these figures had far more challenging contexts in which they were trying to be leaders and, uh, and a history of issues both with whites and blacks that had to be overcome. Yes, yes, some of these people are civil rights leaders in the classic sense that you think about, and some of them are just people doing well. And uh, it's interesting for us to talk to them because they, there's some commonalities and there's some not. I was interested to see how many of the, the men particularly mentioned the Boy Scouts. I was a Cub Scout. I didn't go any further than that. But a couple of them said, you know, the Boy Scouts were so important to them. And I thought, I don't think of black people in that way. I don't think of black people being in, in the Boy Scouts. So I was surprised to hear that. I was an Eagle Scout in a segregated white Boy Scout troop in Mississippi, so I outrank you. I can't yeah. believe that. But the point about the Scouts, I would say, is that uh, a number of, of black men that we interviewed saw the, the Scouts as a opportunity for developing a network as an opportunity for building community in a very, very consistent way over a long period of time and in getting rewards as they went for developing their skills along the way.
So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons the scouts emerged uh, yes. with such power. It also struck me that, that another dimension of this is, again, in the vein of leaders under duress, but that when you have a community of people uh, whose opportunities are so circumscribed, as they were for African Americans up until the 1960s for sure, that the importance of these sort of structural paths to leadership maybe was a little more clear. You know, that, that the, the value of, of a Boy Scouts as connecting into a network that, was, that then is gonna be very important in this world that's kind of against you. In the same way with uh, the narrow range of opportunities in terms of becoming a teacher or a pastor and the value of the church, and the church come, is another thread that comes through all of these. But, but it was interesting to me to sort of contemplate in a way that I had not before, uh, that again, it's one of those responses to duress and responses to, to segregation that in a particular way pulled out leadership from a lot of individuals. I mean, is that, is that a reasonable analysis? Yeah. Oh yes, I think so. I think many of these people we talked to uh, said to themselves without actually saying to themselves, I need to improve my circumstances and I'm gonna do ABC or XYZ or something uh, in ways that other people, I think white people don't have to think about. Uh, so they're unique in that way. Yeah, but another thread that runs through is your frustration and the frustration of a lot of the folks you interviewed about whether younger African Americans in particular and sort of all Americans in general know enough about these events, understand enough about leadership. And I wonder if some of that is, is that with there being less duress, less, uh, the world less against young African Americans today, that it's not quite as clear that I need to be getting ready to play my part or do, do these important leadership things. Well, I think for all the people we talk to, it's clear that they have a role to play and they're gonna play it. Uh, but there may be a, a subset of black people who say, I don't need to do these things. There probably is that I'm not aware of, that I don't need to do these things, but th these people knew they had something oh, yeah, to they, do. Uh, sure, but they, but they worry that their grandchildren might not, their grandchildren might not be as clear, or that, you know, that, that younger people today may not be uh, as aware of what went on before and may not feel as much of an urgency uh, to do some of the sorts of things that their, that their forebears did. Well, is that a reasonable? There, there's, there's less duress in some ways and more in others, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, you know, you have less, uh, less opportunity, perhaps, in the Jim Crow era. Um, but now there's a different kind of duress that's more hidden, and that is, um, is, is so devastating, which we're seeing day in and day out. Every day we pick up the newspapers. Okay, so, well, let, let's go to that. Let's, um, uh, uh, because the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that, that relates very much to that uh, is that there is an interesting thread of, uh, of, of a theme that comes up in different interviews at different times, but and a real awareness on the part of these leaders that there were more obvious objectives, obviously, uh, for the civil rights movement and for black leadership in the 1960s, these institutional uh, actors of duress uh, for, for black people. And that now, though, it's not as clear exactly what the target of, of change should be. Uh, and, the, and there are uh, uh, behaviors and such that it's, it's harder to figure out exactly what the origins of these problems are. It's not as clear that it's just a, a hugely racist white society causing all this. And there's a question of whether the response to some of these things should be entirely through the courts or uh, entirely through government action or other kinds of things. So let's, let's listen to a, a short clip of, uh, of, one of, of a part of one of your interviews. You've written about the destructiveness of slavery, segregation, uh, and talked about the damage done. Can the playing field be leveled by, and, if, and can government level the playing field? And can it do so without breeding the kind of dependency that you've also talked about. I always worried about that endlessly. How far can you go without um, your solution becoming as harmful as what you thought the problem was? There's a lot of harm that, you know, whether it's a broken family, that it's uh, crime, it's uh, uh, habits, it's um, just negative influences that are devastating. I do think that um, when you create these headwinds that prevent people based on race from accomplishing things, that government has to cease that, that you have to rectify that, you have to remedy that. And we attempted to do it in specific areas when I was at EEOC. I don't know how far you can go and how global you can make that without running into constitutional limitations. 
and I also don't know how far you can go doing that without creating or causing additional harms. So Clarence Thomas acknowledging that there is a legacy of harm from segregation. That's something that I think a lot of people would, maybe who don't understand Clarence Thomas as well as they should, uh, but a lot of people, particularly of the, on the liberal side of the American pol political equation, would actually, I think, be surprised to hear Thomas sort of agreeing with the idea that there's a historical legacy of I, racism. I have strong memories of this interview because somehow or another, I asked him about an affirmative action decision by the Supreme Court, the Paradise case, and uh, it, what happened is the Supreme Court ordered that Alabama hire one black tr state trooper for every white state trooper. And he said, no. I said, yes. He stopped the interview. He sent one of his clerks out to get a law book. Clerk came back with the law book. I was right. <laughs> and I was amazed that he didn't know this case, and he should have known it. But anyway, we went on. <laughs> but so the but that's interesting though because that's sort of what we would expect we the, in the sort of general understanding whether you're a fan of Clarence Thomas or not uh, certainly the general rap on Clarence Thomas is that he doesn't understand those kinds of things maybe even doesn't know that history and one would think that he should he was a Supreme Court justice exactly exactly so that's why one would imagine that yeah. but he did though say because and I think he was dis he was then discussing that very case when he went on to say some of what we just heard which was that when the government has really caused these headwinds and really deliberately gone out of its way to cause harm, as in where the state of Alabama had simply refused to hire a single black state trooper, I think that's what led to, the, to that particular judgment eventually. But he's acknowledging there that, okay, in a situation like that, the court should intervene or the government ha does have to do something. But then quickly going to also the observation that you, that you asked him about, at what point uh, how do you balance correcting things without further harming other people? How do you, how do you, how do you hire enough black state troopers uh, without denying the opportunity to be a state trooper to qualified white state troopers? And so, but I, I just, I was struck by that he was giving any ground at all to the idea that there is a legacy of racism and segregation that still needs to be dealt with. Were you surprised by that? A little bit, but I think he's a complicated person. And it's, you don't want to think he's simplistic because he's not at all. But... Uh... I wasn't tremendously surprised at that. Phyllis, when you were thinking through, or the two of you together, about who to include in this, I mean, there are a lot of people, a lot of liberal-minded folks who would say, Clarence Thomas is not a black leader. He's a famous black individual. But there, you know, there are many people who have excommunicated him. Did you wonder about, it was sort of a brave thing to include him. Yeah, <laughs> we wondered. <laughs> we, uh, we debated it, we thought about it. Uh, we wanted in our mix to have uh, people who represented a variety of political persuasions. We, didn't, we also could have been criticized in terms of the mix for only talking to progressive people or they people on the progressive. Right. And so we felt that we needed to have some representatives that would you know, reflect other political uh, and, and, uh, other, and, and values. And so um, one could ask whether he is a leading black or a black leader. That distinction has often been made. The fact of the matter is he sits on the highest court of the land. He is the only African-American representative on that court. Um, and so when he said he was available, we know he doesn't give many interviews. He doesn't talk to many people. We thought this would be a good opportunity to pursue. So yeah, that's yeah why Thomas we did is it. famously unavailable. I was very surprised that he was there. You know, I he ran into him at a book party. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything from what he said that you had the reaction of, okay, actually, this guy does have something, he has some wisdom here. I don't agree with him, but there's some, there's some value to what he has to say. Yes, yes, I, I can't remember a specific, but yeah, sure. He's, as I say, he's more complicated than you think, than you want to think. Yeah. And I uh, think I came to understand from listening to him why he comes to the perspectives that he does. He was very open, it's also in his autobiography, about talking about his own family, his own background and experiences. He came from absolute dire and abject poverty and um, living in a tiny little town of Pinpoint, Georgia. And his father abandoned the family, his mother, uh, developed a relationship with another man who didn't really want to be responsible for children. The two, he and his brother, 
ended up going to live with his mother's father and mother, his grandparents, and his sister went to live with someone else. And their life trajectories have been fundamentally different as a result of that. I believe his sister ended up on welfare. The two brothers clearly had a very different life experience. He totally credits his grandfather for having created that structure, those demands, that self-help entrepreneurial spirit. His grandfather clearly didn't want um, to be dependent on any white person in the society and so became a small independent businessman. I couldn't imagine an interview in which somebody talked about one person more than Clarence Thomas did in this interview. And it was always my grandfather, my grandfather. And so it became pretty clear why you would develop the kinds of values that you do given the kind of background he had. I've always thought that, uh, that some of the reaction to Clarence Thomas has been a bit off base just in the fact that so many people, particularly younger people, have reacted to him uh, as if a black conservative must be a space alien that fell out of a spaceship and landed on America, but that in reality he is the product of this of a, of a grandfather who comes from a long tradition of black conservatism. Back in uh, uh, Julian, I think I've heard you talk before about that. That if you go go back a generation or two, aren't there black Republicans in your family? For oh, sure, yes. My father was a Republican uh, when we lived in Pennsylvania. He uh, was active in Republican Party politics. But uh, it was a different Republican Party then, not like the one, not the nut cases we have now. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that is the thing that's still shocking is that the Republicanism of Clarence Thomas's grandfather was pretty radically different from the Republicanism that he would appear to ascribe to. And now. interesting is, grandfather was very active in the NAACP, which is something he didn't leave to Clarence. Yeah, let's play the second Clarence Thomas clip. I don't know how far you go. The Constitution has very strict limits, in my opinion, on the use of race and sex categories. It says citizenship and person. And I think we have to be very careful that we're not locking in precedents that in the long run will do greater harm. A uh, justice, and I can't remember who, uh, said years ago, if you want to get beyond race, you have to go to race. That was Justice Blackman. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Um, I think it means that you can't t talk about remedies unless those to race, unless those remedies have some race consciousness in them. Yeah, I don't, we're still, you know, I've read that and read it and reread it and I don't know. I mean, I said, how do you get wet? Do we, in order to be dry, you must be wet. I don't know that. I don't understand it. I don't know how you can have the, that's just, but at any rate. Well, it was a great case, uh, which I know a little bit about Paradise versus Alabama. Mm -hmm. State trooper uh, case involving the exclusion of blacks from the state trooper ranks. And the case went through several, several rulings in which courts ordered Alabama to do this. Mm -hmm. And Alabama just wouldn't do yeah. it every time. And finally, after I think three higher court decisions yeah. said to Alabama, you will hire one black state trooper for every white state well, trooper you hire. And imposed a quota. Uh, but you also had a wonderful interview with, with Charles Ogletree. Um, a, uh, known to his friends as Tree, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but a, uh, a brilliant law professor at Harvard. Uh, I've always said, President Company excluded the smartest man in America uh, by far. In your interview with him, you talked about some of these same uh, sorts of questions of the role of the courts and uh, how injustices and legacies of injustice uh, should be dealt with in the present. And Ogletree, of course, is an architect of a lot of uh, very important uh, litigation and efforts through the courts to accomplish things in the tradition of the civil rights movement, the great accomplishments of the NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, and others through the courts to accomplish so much. But then interestingly, he says some things in this interview that, uh, that suggest a sort of a reframing of some of those questions. But so let's, let's listen to that clip and then uh, have you guys respond to, to what you think about that. How to get beyond the tendency to think that everything can be solved by the legal system or in a case or in the courts. Uh, I have matured, I would say, to realize that the courts are important but not the only way to solve our problems. Uh, I have matured to understand that there is a c concept about uh, self uh, uh, so self-help and personal responsibility. That uh, as much as government should and ought to be held accountable and responsible for addressing the needs of the needing, we also have an even greater goal and challenge to uh, address these issues as well. It was interesting to hear him say that. 
because I hadn't expected that from him. Uh, I'm not saying this is the wrong thing to say, but it, it was something I had not expected from him. I want to make sure that's not uh, misunderstood because he actually went on from that little piece to, I think, explain further what he meant by, by self-help and responsibility. And he talked, actually, about um, needing to empower communities to work on issues. And so it wasn't just an individual responsibility, it was really a communal responsibility. He talked about the incredible, his own work in getting parents to be more involved in their children's schools because we all know what an important impact that has on education. He talked about some of his own work, his own legal work in representing rappers, for example. Um, he talked about the importance of working for reparations within the society. So, and then, you know, he said, you have to find ways to make a difference in the society through your own engagement with your communities. And he did talk about, uh, he, may, he went to some lengths to say uh, that, for instance, the No Child Left Behind uh, notion uh, that in its original, uh, the way it was originally talked about is the importance of No Child Left Behind uh, was a good thing and in the sort of communal way that you're referring to, but that it had, he was very critical of how it had actually been implemented as a, uh, as a part of a, a kind of strategy that he wasn't supportive of at all. And, you're, and certainly he hasn't abandoned the litigation approach either. And he also said we have to empower young people to step up. And he said as part of that section, you know, my young law student, Barack Obama, who had been on the law review, you know, I'm watching his career closely. This was before he'd been elected president. So, you know, he, he saw this as, as his responsibility to somehow empower younger people also to take up the mantle of leadership. While we're on Ogletree, let's play, uh, we have another clip from him as well, not far uh, away from the earlier one, but uh, that speaks to some of these similar issues. But let's hear the second Charles Ogletree clip. We had to figure out a way how th those who fled, uh, the black middle class that fled like whites uh, as a result of integration and abandoned urban America have to find a way to reinvest and recapture urban America because when 50% of our children are dropping out of high schools uh, in urban areas around the country. It's not someone else's problem. So what does that add up to in terms of forward-moving leadership, you know, in, ter in terms of what the wisdom of a Charles Ogletree and others who said somewhat similar things in, in others of your interviews, is there a, what's the mandate there for, for, the, for the next Barack Obama, whose name we don't currently know, but this, some emerging black leader of the near, of the near future What's the, how do we interpret what Ogletree was, was telling us there? Well, that as a responsibility, a communal responsibility to, to grapple with these issues and do something about them, as you said a moment ago. Uh, but that goes through all of these, not all, but almost every one of these interviews, people saying something of that nature. You know, there's a, almost a mantra in the African-American community to lift as you climb. And I think one of the most important uh, powerful uh, truths that came out of these interviews is that the vast majority of the leaders we spoke to saw that kind of a responsibility. That, I think, impelled them to leadership. Not every single one, but the vast majority of them. And uh, so the mandate going forward, I, I mean, I, this probably sounds very simplistic, but it's just to get in there and work on issues from any number of fronts. I mean, you know, I think Criminal justice is a huge issue that requires our collective work, the criminal justice system. Education clearly is another one. I mean, I was just reading the other day that something like 38% of 38% of black males in Washington, D.C. graduate from high school. Only 38%. That's shameful in the nation's capital, I think. Let's, uh, let, let's listen to another cut um, from, in this case, from uh, the, your interview with Eleanor Holmes Norton, famous civil rights activist and lawyer, professor of law at Georgetown, chair of the EEOC, and like you, a SNCC organizer back in the day. Uh, but so let's, let's listen to this, these words from Eleanor Holmes Norton. <laughs> 
and I see progress for girls and, and women. And I see the opposite for boys and men, mm -hmm. that for both whites and blacks, there are more women graduating from college. Uh, the white men, of course, may find less than a college education giving them quite a good income, for example, in IT or in some of the, the professions like that, uh, high technology and the rest of it. Um, that is not what is happening to black men. What has happened to black men is a combination of uh, ruthless um, law enforcement strategies like mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines that have sent a, an entire generation of drug peddling, nonviolent black men to jail. Uh, what's happening to black men is that the street culture, which now, of course, is amplified through television and the media, uh, s uh, siphons off young men at a very early age, indeed when they're children, mm -hmm. into the underground economy. And because there are not jobs uh, for able-bodied people who don't have good education as there, were, as there were for their fathers and grandfathers. They've created their own economy. So she's talking about this whole range of, of terrible pathologies in some respect and just uh, and, uh, uh, unexpectedly difficult circumstances, whatever we want to call them, but this whole range of, of issues that arose in, particularly in urban communities, I think, in the, in the aftermath, to some degree, they weren't completely absent before the civil rights era, as some people claim, but, but this much sort of, uh, like I said before, elusive set of issues that, that one can't come up with uh, just a, we need to take down this bad practice that's been established for so long to fix it. But what, the, what was your reaction to uh, to those sorts of observations. I'm going to make an unfair uh, comparison, but sometimes when, uh, when some of your interviewees talked about what some people would refer to as negative behavior, and I think some of them actually called it that, negative or inappropriate behavior by African Americans, I had this reaction of uh, um, uh, that, that this is sounding a little bit like Bill Cosby uh, when, when he was saying things like black people need to clean their act up uh, and, and was very controversial for that. But what was, what was your reaction to those? Well, it wasn't a Bill Cosby reaction. Um, I was present when Bill Cosby first dropped this bomb uh, inappropriately at a NAACP uh, celebration. Uh, but at any, any rate, uh, when you hear these kinds of, of concerns, and we heard them over and over again, uh, I think our response, or mine at least, was to say, this person's right, and we need to do something about it. And sometimes this person is saying, here's what the uh, something is try X, try Y, try Z, and so on. And Eleanor Holmes Norton established a DC coalition for men and boys in Washington, focusing, I think, primarily on mentoring and on job training, kind of job core program. So she, she put a lot of weight behind specific outcomes that uh, could perhaps change that trajectory. But, you know, I think we shouldn't forget that we, that the great society programs of the 1960s uh, created, um, created a way forward for us. I mean, there were remarkable outcomes from some of those programs, all of, many of which were gutted in the 1980s. And then, of course, we have these new, new laws that got put into effect. Um, enormously increasing the prison populations for very, very petty offensive offenses. We know when people come out of prison that their opportunities become much more limited. So, you know, th th those are the fronts that we really need to work on. And we need to recognize that I think, uh, you know, most of our black leaders did recognize that government has an important role to play in this, and yet we live in a society where we seem to have lost our collective will to have the government work to help solve some of these problems. It's not to say that individuals don't have responsibilities and communities don't, but it, it just has to be both and. I'm sometimes struck by how infrequently uh, we hear 
uh, people addressed that very thing, that, that in fact uh, there was a lot of success, at least by certain measures, uh, from some of those programs that are so vilified now. And, uh, and so, and you have instead, very frequently, your black leaders talking about um, things that you know, really a bit more like what would now be called, certainly by Republicans, faith-based uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, but, but not really the argument for the government in a really muscular way, like it did in the, in the early 1970s, needs to, be back, needs to be attacking these things in a systemic way. But were you surprised that, or is that a bigger element of the interviews than I realize? Well, I think it's a common thread that runs through black America uh, we used to do X and, and now we don't do it. We used to do Y and now we don't do it. Uh, it was successful. Why, why did we cut it out? Did we cut it out because it was successful? Uh, and so on. So this is a, a, a common part of the discussion in, in the community. Let's go to another cut. Um, let's listen to uh, Robert Franklin, uh, who's a really interesting former president of Morehouse College, uh, a pastor and theologian, uh, um, remarkable intellectual. Uh, and let's hear this cut from him where he talks about some things that relate to this, uh, but that also puts in the context of the church as an institution in the black community. It had another agenda, and that was, that was the agenda of people making, mm -hmm. of, of fostering uh, family, of, uh, of healing wounds, the, the both physical and, and psychic wounds that people encountered as they grappled every day with, uh, in, in, in a racist society. And that was hard work. That's important work. And uh, every week the people gather with the expectation, at least in a black church, that uh, some measure of re-knitting the unraveling fabric of family, neighborhood, of civil society will happen. What is so great about these clips is it introduces the people who watch it to a whole generation of people whom they may not know. Uh, who would know this man, uh, who's a well-known figure in a section of black America, but probably not well-known nationwide. And he's a wonderful, wonderful figure, and you see this and you see that. Yeah, absolutely, and a, just a brilliant voice and an inspiring leader, on what, even if you don't agree with him on, on everything that he says, but just a, uh, an incredibly inspiring and evocative intellectual, really. But so he's talking there about the, the church as, as it was, this incredibly important institution of black life, particularly in the segregated South, uh, one of the two refuges for African Americans in terms of the church and the segregated black schools, but these, these two places where there was some safety in this world of duress for so many African Americans, and the importance of the church in this sort of healing role. Uh, and we come back to that frequently in the present, not just in your interviews, but in lots of discussion about the importance of the church. But I'm interested, particularly Julian, from you, I mean, you're not a believer, are you? No. Yeah, I thought that was the case. Uh, and so... Is that my reputation? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've said it to me before, um, uh, the, or at least in my presence. The, uh, but so you're not a believer, uh, and the, but that's not to say you don't believe in the power of the church uh, in its own way in the community. But, the, but nonetheless, the, it says something. Uh, and, and the role of the church, particularly as a healer, is well known and established as, as a refuge. But the role of black church leadership at the beginning of the civil rights era was a lot more checkered. You know, there were a lot of pastors in Mississippi, black pastors in Mississippi, who did not want guys like you from SNCC to, to, roll, in, to roll into certain places at certain times uh, because it was disrupting things in, in unsettling, dangerous ways. Uh, and now we're, there's also been some criticism. I remember Coretta Scott King some years ago, before her death, obviously, uh, she gave a really important speech to, uh, at a gathering of African-American church leaders in which she came out and said the black church has been silent on HIV and we've been in denial because of our conservative social values was I think implicitly what she was saying and that has to change the black church has to play a different role in a different time but but what's your is it a little too pat for leaders to say the church can take care of these things or play this role, and is there really a record of that? Oh, oh certainly, there, there's a record of that, but certainly you don't expect the church to take care of all these things, and I think sometimes people do think the church will do it, and the church is not gonna do all these things. It may try, and let's hope it does, and let's hope it does its best, but you can't say the church is gonna take care of these things. What do you make of that, in, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, that liberal white churches were really on the correct side of things that are as close as anybody white institutionally could get to in that period of time. 
conservative churches were really in the wrong place in terms of white churches. Black church was playing this role that you've just described. But now here we are, it's 50 years later, and there is this new phenomenon that I find kind of remarkable that's built around social values and uh, uh, concern about abortion and a, a much more faith-based sort of understanding, but that you have conservative white churches, non-denominational evangelical churches, that are really the most active players along with their black counterparts uh, in bringing black people and white people together uh, in, a, in a religious setting. You know, the, the first real desegregation of the most segregated hour in America, oddly enough, is happening sort of on the terrain of the folks who were totally opposed to the civil rights movement 50 years ago. And, that, and that's just a striking, uh, a striking reality to me. But does it look odd to you when you turn on the TV and see it's, all these black and white people on stage on a televangelism it does show? Look, it does look odd to me, <laughs> not in a bad way, in a good way. I'm not sure I, I, I totally know what to make of that, but I think, um, you know, if it works, if it brings people together, if it focuses on the right values, if it is uh, inclusive and not spawning other kinds of prejudice, then I'm for it. And if it's not <laughs> but fake. I'm, but, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure it does all those things. In the, in the aftermath of the, pa of the celebration of the 64 Civil Rights Act, a book was published whose name I can't remember, that gave enormous credit to the mainstream Christian church for helping pass this legislation. And the author argued that this phenomenon doesn't exist today, and I think he's right. The mainstream churches seem to be absent without leave today in these ways. And, and while it's good to hear about the phenomenon you described with these conservative churches, good for them. Uh, but what happened to the mainstream churches? Where are they? Why don't we hear their voices? What, have you seen the movie Selma? Yes, twice. What, what did you think of the scene? We'll, we'll ignore for a moment the, the thing that's been talked about the most around Selma in terms of uh, historical accuracy. But what did you think of the scene when uh, <clears throat> Dr. King uh, uh, arrives and John Lewis and was it James Farmer who's depicted being next to him? I'm trying to remember. Or was it Form, who was Foreman? Who was it? Foreman. Foreman. Jim Foreman, right? Yeah, so the, Dr. King comes into the room and now Congressman John Lewis, uh, early important SNCC organizer, uh, and another SNCC organizer sitting next to him, and th there's a dispute over, uh, over who should run what's about to happen in Selma. But was that, a, was that an accurate depiction? I'm just curious about that. As far, I know you weren't there, but uh, as far as your understanding of the relationship between this youth-oriented organization of SNCC and the church-based uh, organization of Dr. King? Yes, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was there first, before Dr. King came. Uh, but what's troublesome about the depiction of James Foreman, who is the CEO of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, is first he was older than Dr. King, but he's treated as a youngster, a kid, with a hot temper, uh, and just a terrible portrayal of, of this decent, decent guy who was a wonderful figure in the Civil Rights Movement. And luckily, uh, the movie doesn't call his name out that much, so maybe nobody will know who they, he's supposed to be, but it's just an awful depiction of a, of a wonderful guy and uh, unnecessary, too. Well, that's interesting because it does, uh, but I, if I were to channel for the director of the film, uh, I, I think what she probably would say is that perhaps there was some dramatic license taken there, but that it was to underscore that there was this tension between SNCC and its somewhat different purposes and tactics and the Southern, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was very church-based and, uh, and prophetically inspired. But is that larger depiction of the tension there, is that a, is that a reasonable portrayal? It, it's reasonable, but uh, it's irritating. <laughs> Tremendously irritating. And you know, you, I, people learn their history from these movies. And of course, if they're gonna learn some bad history, about LBJ from this movie if they look at it. I urge people to see it. I think it, parts of it are wonderful. It's worthwhile going to see. I hope everybody who watches this show goes to see it. But they ought to understand that there are things in it that just aren't true. Well, let's sit on that for a minute since so many people are interested in this. But so it sounds like you, uh, you're sympathetic to the idea that President Johnson is portrayed in a way that's not quite. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. How so? Well, here, think about this succession of, of, of images. Here is Martin Luther King and, and LBJ talking together, and LBJ doesn't get what he wants from, LB, from Martin Luther King. Then L, LBJ says, get me J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, 
Then the next thing you know, Mrs. King and Dr. King are listening to the sex tape. And you're saying to yourself, oh, LBJ, bar top, Dr. King. Well, it wasn't Dr. King, it was, John, it was Robert Kennedy who did that. And it just made uh, LBJ a bad guy, when in this instance, he's the good guy. He's the good guy. He's the best civil rights president we ever had in America. And to treat him in this way is just awful. You know, he has a lot of bad things he did, but this is not one of them. Well, it's interesting, too, just going back to the discussion we were having a second ago of that uh, part of the danger, uh, and, and I think I would agree historically with your depiction of things just there and your, your concern, I, I would share it. And one of the problems with that is not just sort of getting that sequence wrong, but also that this guy was the architect after having been a bad guy on race in an earlier time. True. He then is the architect of these things that accomplished so much good, at least by a lot of analysis, and so that whole legacy gets uh, at best obscured uh, when, when he then is portrayed in, in this kind of way. It, it is a risky thing. Let me ask you another thing about that. Uh, someone even more unknown to most people, uh, but who was briefly in that film, and that's Diane Nash, uh, who was... She didn't have a word to say. <laughs> and she and her husband are the people who thought of the idea of picking Selma, of having a movement in Selma, of having a march from Selma to Montgomery. Diane Nash and her husband then, James Bevel, they're the people who thought up this. Not Martin Luther King, not LBJ, these two people, exactly. this couple. Exactly. And so I was so struck that here you have a film that <laughs> is directed by an African-American woman, uh, funded and starred in to some degree by another super famous African-American woman, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and, the, and then you end up with that here's the seminal figure from the time, one of the relatively few women who played mm -hmm. such important roles. Uh, and yet she, certainly by my estimation, was terribly underrepresented and even absolutely, misrepresented. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. She's a forgotten person. Yeah. Well, it's a striking thing. So back to black leadership. Uh, this film comes out, it's got these problems to it, uh, problems with it. Andy Young came out at one point and said, his response was, they've got the depiction of John F. K uh, of Andy Young comes out and says, they have the depiction of Lyndon Johnson wrong, but that everything else is really beautiful. And I think you really meant thematically, the, you know, the big notes uh, were right. John Lewis uh, um, was more, uh, generally defensive, I think, of, you know, of, of, in support of the film. But there has mostly been, from current day black leaders, particularly as you get younger, I think, a sort of rallying around the film and, uh, and a real pushback against, a, 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 and a sort of an implication that this is white folks trying to, trying to take down this movie because they don't like the way their white guy is treated. But has there been enough of your voice that you just had and other folks like you to sort of come out and say, wait a minute, there really is a serious problem here. No, there hasn't been enough. Uh, LBJ doesn't have that many defenders. Joseph Califano defended him and defended him wrongly. Exactly. So it made things worse. Yeah. What do you mean by wrongly? I think, but what do you, how did he defend him wrongly? Well, he argued that uh, LBJ was responsible for Selma being chosen and that's just not the case. Yeah, he, so, he encourages that this kind of activity uh, and recognizes the value of it uh, in bringing the media's attention to these problems and that that will help move forward the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but he doesn't say Selma's the place to do it. Clearly, it's not his idea, but, but he certainly also isn't opposed to it. And, no, and not, he's not, not at all opposed to it. And uh, to treat him as badly as the movie does, I think does real dishonor to the movie. We have talked a lot about these lingering uh, pathologies and issues and disappointments that, that while we have the, the, there's been so much progress in many respects, we've got a black president, all, all these positive things, but these negative factors remain, the, the, the disparity and the gap uh, in terms of uh, income and educational attainment between African Americans. But at the same time that we have all of that and mass incarceration, there are these interesting macro trends at work as well, where, for instance, uh, Phyllis, you pointed out the really abysmal uh, high school graduation rates for African American males, I think you were referring to, in Washington, D.C. But nationally, the graduation rates of African Americans have steadily risen and, and are at a kind of essentially an all-time high. It's, it's, uh, they've gone from, in the last 20 years, 84% to 92%. Uh, really amazing. And, uh, and graduation rates among white students have gone uh, from, in the same period of time, from 91% to 95%. So, but you've got 95 and 92. You, you have rough kind of parity being achieved at the high school level. Then things change dramatically. Uh, when you get to, when you get in the college years, but and similarly, uh, you have that 
and a lot of people are surprised when I point this out, but the, we have all of our discussion about mass incarceration, and it is this big, huge issue, obviously, but the incarceration rates have flattened and maybe gone, begun to go down a little bit for African-American males. Meanwhile, the fastest growing incarceration rate is among white females. Uh, there's this skyrocketing um, uh, incarceration rate of, of white women. It's increased 38% uh, uh, between 2000 and 2010. The other thing that surprises people, I think, is that, uh, that the teen pregnancy rate, which you know, in these old brutal cliches and stereotypes that were thrown around about African-American girls and teen pregnancy rates, but in reality, for the last 20 years, pregnancy rates among black girls have fallen precipitously and the teen pregnancy rate of white girls is going up. Uh, and so there are these, these sort of fascinating things that also just more of the complexity of, of the issues and that they're not just limited to African Americans. But, but how, do you, how do you react to that at the same time there are these really negative things happening and things like Ferguson, at the same time there are these cross currents that say maybe, maybe we're on the right path. But how do you react to that? I don't know. These are headaches. Uh, you think about what happened in Ferguson and the failure of the criminal justice system to remedy this. It, it's good news to read in the New York Times today that uh, one of the policemen who shot a guy has been indicted for the marginal, marginal crimes. Um, but it seems like we're just repeating these things over and over and over again. This police black community relationships have always been worrisome, always been troublesome. The police have always behaved badly, and uh, we've not been able to, to corral it in any way. Uh, we have to develop new strategies, I think, new things to do, because what we're doing now isn't working. I'm confused about the education statistics you just gave us. Uh, I know that there is data out there that suggests this enormous rise in high school graduation rate, but there's also other data that says that it depends on how you count high school graduation, and that more and more people, especially some of those who are incarcerated, are earning degrees through the GED program, and then we count those as part of our statistics of high school graduates. Yet we know that those people aren't competitive in the job market, and, yeah. and that they are not earning incomes even commensurate with a high school degree. So again, it just depends on how you count the statistics yeah. as to whether we really have an ongoing continuing problem. And I just told you the statistic earlier in New York, I think 37% of black men graduate from high school and in Washington it's 38. And there's data there, state by state, you yeah. can look at it. Yeah, no, there's no doubt that, that you know, it's not as, we haven't worked it all out. Uh, and sure. it, it brings us back to, again, it's all complicated. It's yeah. all hugely complicated and requires a, uh, a complexity of leadership that, you know, that, it, uh, that on the part of everybody, uh, no doubt about that. Is there anything about uh, the lessons of black leadership that come out of this? Go back to Ferguson. Is there anything that anybody could have led differently, black or white, but particularly black, that might, had, might have, I mean, the wisdom of the folks you talk to, is there something that might have happened before that day, maybe 20 years before that day, but is there some other path of leadership that might have been followed where that day never came, the, the day that Michael Brown was killed? Probably so. There are probably, among the 50 people we interviewed, Probably some genius could say, well, wow, why don't we do this? Is that something we never thought of? But uh, that doesn't mean that people aren't working to think about it and aren't hoping to find some way to, I mean, this is just awful. This wave of, of shootings of black men is just awful, terrible. And uh, the fact that we've not been able to halt it or punish the shooters, punish the killers, the murderers, we haven't been able to punish the murderers is, is a condemnation of the whole society. Last thought. You mentioned that you couldn't get President Obama to sit for an interview, uh, but so after having done all this work, having talked to so all of these brilliant and important people, what's your assessment of uh, President Obama as a black leader or as a leader? And I don't think of him as a black leader, not that he's not a black figure, a black person, uh, but I think of him as a president. Does that say something, that you don't view him as a black leader? I don't know, I don't think so. Um, but. Uh, I think he's, whenever I think about him at all, it is to think about the tremendous handicaps he faces 
from a Republican Party which said from the very first, we want him to fail. And they've done everything they can to make him fail. Uh, and it's amazing that he hadn't gotten up one morning and said, to hell with this, I'm going home. Uh, I think a lesser man would have done that. Uh, I think he's done a, a great many wonderful things. He's stopped two wars. He's created health care. He's done a wonderful series of things. He's a great achiever. And uh, I'm happy he's there. He's helped us get through the recession, which is yeah. incredibly yeah. important as well. Well, thank you both for the, for the work that you've done on all of this and for giving us all this time today. It's been great. Thank you. For more about Phyllis Leffler and Julian Bond's Black Leadership Project and to see other episodes of this program, visit us at millercenter.org, American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next time.